Uh, good morning. Uh, you're here because you made a choice to come to see Zach Dennis's talk uh, about sand piles and software, and uh, uh, you made the right choice. This is, is going to be an excellent talk, and I'm really, really excited to see it. Uh, first, one quick point of order. You may have been handed a uh, feedback sheet to, to fill out about you should talk to you today. Just wanted to point out that uh, it would be best if you would be able to fill out one sheet per presentation. Is that right, Chuck? Sure. Yep. Um, and just to briefly introduce Zach, I've known Zach since probably 2005 or 2006. Uh, he went into business uh, uh, back in 2006, I would say, 2007, yeah. uh, with, with one of my very best friends, uh, Mark Van Holstein. Uh, and the two of them are partners at a company called Mutually Human Software. And Mutually Human Software is a software craftsmanship software studio out in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And it is by far the, the, the studio that I recommend the most when people need custom software done because I really trust them and trust the work that they do. Uh, also, Zach was instrumental in getting the RSpec book written. Uh, and the RSpec book is one of the first books that I recommend people uh, who are interested in behavior-driven development and test-driven development. It's an absolutely phenomenal book, not just on the tool RSpec, but on the entire practice. Um, and why I'm excited about not just Zach being here, but this talk in specific is I was able to sit down and talk through the talk with him while he was still working on it. And it showed great evidence of Zach's uh, level of introspection and self-awareness about his craft, the seriousness that he takes of it, uh, and how he's used those traits about himself to really know himself and how he works and how other developers work. Uh, and hopefully share that in terms of uh, helping everyone understand the importance to know why it is we do what we do. And, and this talk is a fantastic facet of that. So without further ado, I'll introduce uh, Zach Dennis to come up on the stage and share with us. Can everyone, while well, the, I'm going to guess you can hear me because I can hear myself. Perfect. Um, well, as Justin said, thanks a lot for coming out today. So I'm glad to be down here. Um, this is my second trip to Columbus. Um, this talk is primarily going to be on sand piles and software and kind of what we can glean from that as a metaphor for software development and how it applies to our day in and day out lives as craftsmen. Um, but we're also going to talk about a number of other things. Uh, and we're going to start by talking about uh, this picture, a ginormous elephant and a little girl. Um, so elephants, you know, what do elephants have to do with, with sand or software for that matter? Um, well, n nothing really, except that both of them are awesome metaphors for kind of what we do uh, as software developers. Um, you see, the, the girl in the photo here is, is kind of us. These are software teams. The elephant is kind of, that's our software. And I guess, what would this picture kind of convey to you as what's, what's going on? What's, what's the team got going on with the software? All right, major, major challenges. That's definitely one of the things going on. The software is huge. It's stubborn. It's ginormous. Um, it's, it's this giant, complex, stubborn beast. And despite all of our effort, you know, we are this little girl trying to push it. And it's just not going to budge. Um, Rich Hickey gives a talk on simplicity. And he uses this analogy of pushing an elephant to describe what happens when your software gets to a certain point of complexity. And once it gets to that certain point, it doesn't matter the, the tools, um, the practices, the things that you do at that point. Um, because no matter what you do, um, you're really not going to get that elephant to go very far. So you know, a lot of our software over time especially gets, gets ginormous and complex and stubborn. It's difficult to work with. So kind of how does this happen? Well, it started many, many days, thousands of moons ago, when our, our elephant was young, nimble, swift, carefree. Um, and we were there with it frolicking through the forest. Um, and it was still young. And it started with us. Um, the decisions that we made day in and day out from the beginning, the things that we decided to do or not do. So if we kind of tack on stuff today from day one, if we start doing something today, we're probably going to take the same approach tomorrow. So if, if we go in there and when we want to add some new functionality and we just say, hey, our code base is really small and, you know, and we can just throw this in there and get this going just like that, then we're probably going to do that today, but we're also probably going to do that tomorrow, next week, and 
a year from now when the software is not so small and easy to work with. If we're writing tests today, we're probably going to write tests tomorrow. So if this is a practice that's kind of ingrained in our behavior as craftsmen, um, it's probably going to be something that we, we do through and through. Uh, and this doesn't refer to the times where you sometimes go and decide to write a test uh, and then get really upset because it was really difficult or the test was really painful. Um, this is kind of the, the through and through you're actually going through and, and thinking about how you're crafting the software, um, how you're going to make it testable. So if you're doing those things today, you're probably going to do those tomorrow. The same thing goes with refactoring. If you refactor as you go, you clean things up as you go today, you're probably again going to do that tomorrow. And you probably notice a trend here. Um, if you're striving for simplicity today, then you're probably also going to strive for simplicity tomorrow. And if you don't do any of these things, then you're probably not going to do any of these things tomorrow. And all of this is to kind of say is that as unpredictable as our software can be, um, as unique as it can be, we are actually quite predictable in how we go about producing it. Uh, we're, we're kind of, we're humans, we're creatures of habit. So our brains, being humans, are quite lazy. Um, if it can opt out of doing some critical thinking, it's going to. Uh, if, if there's a, a quicker path of, of path of least resistance, our brain's going to kind of suggest, let's go that route. Um, and this is why the past habits often kind of predict our future behavior. So if we're doing any of those other practices, any of those other things that we just saw today and we do those tomorrow, we're kind of reinforcing in our brain that you know, this, is, this is just the default approach I want to take when I tackle this type of problem. But if we don't do those things, then it's going to feel very odd and unfamiliar and awkward to start doing them. And we probably won't do them. We don't even have to know the details of the things that lie ahead. Um, the software we work on from project to project, you may be working on the same types of things. You may be working on drastically different things. Um, it might be a completely new challenge that you're facing next week, next year. Um, and it, it doesn't really matter, though, because all of those unknowns kind of play back to the regularity of how we go ahead and try to produce software and try to solve those problems in code. Every now and then, we, we break out of it. You know, we have an aha moment. We go to a conference like this, we see Ron Jeffries talk, and we get inspired. So we go back and we try something different. But if we, if we don't keep practicing that, if we don't keep doing that, then what happens is we kind of fall back in line and we get back into our old habits. It's kind of like a, a pendulum, um, in a sense. If you bump a pendulum, it's going to be knocked out of its rhythm but it's eventually going to fall back into its natural rhythm. So whatever our practices are that we tend to uh, kind of continuously iterate on to produce an emer you know, this, this software, um, we can create something that's extremely beautiful. It may be extremely complicated, or I should say extremely complex, but it may be extremely beautiful and it may be something that, that serves its purpose and serves its purpose well. Or we may end up with a pile of garbage. Of course, it didn't start out this way. When it started out, we had this in mind. But nine months, a year, two years into it, maybe less, we, we ended up with this. In hindsight, though, and I'm guilty of this, um, it's easy to pinpoint all of the places where we went wrong, all the the kind of forks in the road where we took the wrong fork or the, the wrong path. Um, and we had all these feedback mechanisms kind of talk to us and we didn't necessarily listen. The first feedback mechanism, um, the, my personal favorite, is kind of the gut feel. This is kind of our, our intuition where our brain's not doing a whole lot of critical thinking. Uh, we, we see a scenario and our brain suggests, hey, I want to go this route. Um, or you look at some code and, and you just cringe. You don't even have to think about it, but in like a split second you're cringing because you see something in that code that your, your brain recognizes as, hey, this is, this is problematic, this is not good. Then we've got peer review. Whether we're doing pair programming, whether you're doing formal code reviews or kind of informal code reviews, you've got feedback from other people. Um, and hopefully the T 
teammates that you're working with are honest enough and you guys have the mutual respect and trust for one another to call each other out when you see some bogus code. Um, tests are another one. Uh, tests are awesome feedback, not just in the sense that they kind of let us know when you um, cause regressions, but also in the sense of they let us know when our code's not testable, they let us know when our design is probably a little bit complex. Um, one thing related to testing, though, that I, th I think kind of it gets a bad rap for sometimes is if you're not experienced with uh, testing a whole lot or also with like OO design, then what happens is you try to do something in a test and it feels awkward and it feels unfamiliar. And you immediately equate that with like, oh, you know, this is my, my test has given me pain, my design is bad. And that might not be the case. It just might be that we're not quite equipped yet um, to handle that situation. Um, Uh, then the, the last feedback mechanism I want to point out is kind of metrics. Um, there are a plethora of tools, libraries, um, frameworks, things that go in and analyze your code for any number of languages. Uh, and they give you complexity metrics. They talk about code growth over time. Um, they tell you, you know, kind of, they can give you the idea of who's the best committer, who's the worst committer in terms of who's added the most complexity, who's reduced the most complexity. But, um, Metrics are one of the things that I don't think we as an industry kind of utilize enough. Um, who here actually has like some kind of code analysis in their, uh, their build process? That's, that's more than I thought, but it's still far less than half of the room. Um, who does, um, runs code metrics at least manually, like every, at least once every two weeks? Okay, it's like the, the, same, the same group of hands um, is going out, but still that, that was probably less than a third. Um, so this is, the, the metrics is something that like there's this feedback, but we don't know about it because we don't either use it or listen to it a whole lot. Um, and there are some tools out there. Uh, I, I think just like quick side tangent, um, metrics is going to be a place where I think is going to be able to really change or disrupt how we develop software. Um, once it gets to the point um, that it's easy enough that you push your code somewhere or there's a post commit hook somewhere and then some service is automatically grading your code and is telling you on the fly. So you, you get away from this kind of historical outlook on how is my code the last six months because while that's nice, that's not really that helpful. You want to know how your code is right now and you want to know how your code is going to be moving forward. And I'm sure there's a bunch of other feedback mechanisms along the way. Uh, but the reason I bring up the feedback stuff is that we, we don't always pay attention to it, and sometimes our brain gets it wrong, even when we do pay attention to it. Um, how many, has anyone here seen this diagram before? All right. So all the ones who didn't raise your hands, you're not allowed to, to, to answer the question. Uh, which one of these lines is the longest? I, I know I, you guys don't have mics, so you gotta yell. Okay, yeah, they're all, they're all the same length, but they don't look like it. When you first see it, your brain wants to assume that the one on the bottom is the longest, and then the second one is the second longest, and the shortest is the top one. You kind of have to override uh, what your brain is trying to suggest, and you, you have to kind of put on some critical thinking and say they are all the same length. Um, but even though that, now that you know that, every time you see something like this, your brain is initially going to think that, you know, they are not the same length. And each time you've got to know to override it. And this is, applies to software and is important because we go ahead and we make small changes. Maybe it's a quick fix. Maybe there's an urgent need. Something needs to get done real quick. So, so we go in there and, you know, we break a window while we're doing it. We make some, I would say, some, some bad design decisions. But, you know, it's, it's really, it's high priority. It's very urgent. So what we intuit is that, you know, it's just one window. It's not that bad. Um, the overall impact to the entire system is going to be negligible because it's just one small thing. We can go back and clean it up later. But then what really happens is this guy over here where you've got a ton of, a ton of broken windows. Um, and there are kind of two things about this analogy that I want to point out. One is the broken window effect, which is, who here is familiar with the broken window effect? Okay, a good number. 
So the idea is that if you leave a window broken for a, um, a period of time, what's going to happen is uh, you know, more windows are going to get broken. People are going to kind of feel a sense of abandonment in their neighborhood. Um, no one's really going to keep things tidy. Things get run down over time. And that kind of happens in the software, too. But then there's something more interesting, which is kind of the, the cascaded broken window effect, which really has nothing to do with over time as much as it has to do with uh, dependencies between your code. So let's say that you intended to only break this window. So you went into one object, and you were going to go in there and, and just implement a quick fix. But what happens is that object has collaborators. It has consumers. Um, any public methods on it have inputs. You're going to probably supply some outputs. So these things are going to interact with different components in the system. So when you go in there and you make a bad decision that's going to break one window, those things very likely are going to have negative impacts on some of those things that the object is dealing with. Um, and then those kind of can cascade and keep cascading on down. Um, a, a quick code example I'm going to give. This isn't um, in Ruby, but uh, it doesn't do anything that's Ruby specific. So there was a project that we came on a while ago to help out with. And um, there was this giant mess in there that had to do with talking to solar and modeling things in our side of the system with the solar data. And we were trying to figure out how it had gotten to this giant behemoth. So we went and kind of looked back through a bunch of the commits. Um, from the team that created it. And we found that they wanted to deal with uh, records from solar, and they're just dealing with them with, as a simple array. And they said, hey, you know, we, we actually, now that we need to talk to solar, we should probably do something that gives us the ability to do that. So, you know, it'd be simple just to subclass array, and then we don't have to change anything else um, except for that line of code that instantiates it. So they went ahead and subclassed array had the subclass talk to solar. Then they found that solar's HTTP calls sometimes failed, or they sometimes passed in bad options, which returned um, 500s on the solar side, or 404s. So they went and opened up their array subclass and figured they'd just add all the exception handling there. And then they wanted to be able to pass in more, more options um, to do some querying. So they figured, what the heck? You know, we've got this awesome array subclass. We're just going to go in there and, and update that to ha handle all of these other options. And then they decided that they wanted to query solar for multiple models in our system. So rather than um, have something that was reusable, um, that didn't have to know about the different models, they actually they created the, this constant off the top, this facet list which listed all of the classes that they wanted to do the solar querying on. And then they went and they did some metaprogramming to loop over and define um, methods at runtime for all of these things. So now the array knows, or the subclass knows all about all of these models. Um, and again, they're thinking is nothing else has to change. But then they got some crazy requirements. They need, need to add even more, more and more um, options and more and more model-specific requirements. But since they already had the subclass that did all of this stuff, they decided that it would just be easier to just go in there and then just add a bunch of conditionals, handle all the options, and add a bunch of conditionals to handle model-specific um, handling of the solar response. And then it got one step worse. Um, they decided that uh, they wanted to query solar for slightly different kinds of models, so it wasn't exactly the same. Like it was, it was far enough outside that they actually decided not to use the other array subclass. Um, and they figured, you know, well, shucks, we've got a working implementation. It seems to be working all right. Let's go ahead and follow that approach. So they essentially used this thing as boilerplate for doing this all over again in another part of the system. Um, and if you, if you you might be able to guess that there were no test first, no test after. There were no tests around any of this stuff. Um, this has been very, very painful to test. It would have been a great feedback to have here. But all of their changes, and they were expecting the whole time that they were going to go back and like fix this. Um, but they just got more and more like 
urgent needs from um, from the business side of things. So they just they never had the opportunity to go back and fix it. But software is is not linear. So as you're going through and, and they're making these decisions and thinking like, you know, each of these is pretty small by itself. It's going to have a just a small impact on the overall system. You know, and, and then tomorrow we'll, make, we'll do the same thing. We'll have another uh, poor, you know, poor decision that's going to have a small impact. And it keeps on kind of iterating and cascading. Um, but software doesn't work out that way. It's not linear. It's nonlinear. And these graphs are uh, complexity metrics um, from one of the projects. And the blue up on the top is this is over time. This is how complexity was added to the system on a per commit basis. So you can see it, it goes up, it spikes a little, it goes down a little, spikes a little, it goes down a little. And then this bottom graph, uh, and the blue is still the complexity, but the red is the actual size of the code change. So we can see, like, based on the size of the code change, did we uh, increase complexity by a lot or did we decrease complexity? And there's quite a few spikes in there, um, and sometimes it dips. But w one change today doesn't correspond to like a negligible effect tomorrow. It actually it, it compounds. One change today can have those cascading broken, broken window effects throughout the system. And this is because software kind of it feeds back into itself. We iterate as we build things. So what we end up with today is going to be the input for what we're going to produce tomorrow. And then the, what we produce tomorrow is going to be the input of what we're going to use to produce the thing the next day. Does anyone know what this image is? Yeah, it's a glider from Conway's Game of Life. Um, and it's, you, we're never going to get back to time one uh, because a previous change is going to impact future changes. And this is, I believe, to be true also in our software. And not to belabor the point, but. This is a, a, a simple function which I think speaks immense volumes about software. Our, our input is 0 0.2, um, and then we're comparing that to an input of 0 0.2, and then a lot of zeros, and then a 1. So that's a very negligible, I would, I would say, you know, negligible difference. But what happens is over time, you can see that the, the red and the blue start to separate. Initially, you can't see the blue because the red and the blue are overlapping. Yeah, they're kind of perfectly in sync. But at some point, they become bigger differences. And then as you go farther on down, they become even bigger. But it was such a minute change, it didn't seem at the time that when we started over here that we were going to end up with a giant difference down the road. And that's, a, a, I think, a common misconception as we go in and make, make changes um, to the system. Anyone recognize this movie? Oh, man. Last time, the last time I gave this talk, I only got one person here. I've gotten several people. So. A lot of Ashton Kutcher fans. All right. <laughs> All right, so, so that, that last graph um, that we just saw, those really negligible changes making big differences over time, that's kind of similar to the butterfly effect, which is kind of the colloquial term for um, chaos theory. And when we think of chaos, we think of like complicated and messy things, you know, it's random. Um, but chaos in this sense is really quite orderly. It's um, nearly deterministic. And it really just means that since there is this sensitivity in our initial conditions, um, because of that, these small variations are going to lead to really drastically different res and unpredictable results. Even though we can map out the, we could very simply map out all of the, the functions that are going to produce it, we won't be able to predict what's going to happen the hundredth time. And we're just about to talk about some sand piles. Um, but in a very poetic sense, for the want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For the want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For the want of the horse, the rider was lost. For the want of the rider, the battle was lost, and for the one of the battle, the war was lost. Uh, and I, I think sometimes this, this is what software can feel like. 
Um, that small decision that we decided not to do early on uh, ended up cascading down and it helped create this giant mess that we might be dealing with today. So uh, we're going to borrow, we're going to talk about a little bit and borrow from the world of physics and find a simple and elegant metaphor um, for software development. And the thing I want to talk about is the Bach Tang Weisenfeld sandpile model. These guys are all physicists who, in the 1980s, uh, they were exploring dynamical systems. And a dynamical system, much like software, is just a system that can have a large scale um, mac macroscopic change uh, from small scale microscopic changes. So, if you close your eyes for a second, just imagine you're dropping a grain of sand in your mind's eye. Um, and if you can't visualize it, it's a picture. What happens as you drop sand on your pile? What happens to the pile? All right, usually the first, the first thing that gets thrown out is it gets bigger. And that's true. And then usually the second thing is, is that it landslides. Um, as you're dropping one grain of sand and you keep dropping them, your pile gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it's got a, it landslides, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it landslides. And it keep, as long as you keep feeding the system, keep dropping grains of sand, it's going to have the same exact pattern of behavior. And this pattern of behavior is called self-organized criticality. And this is a property of a system that has this, this critical point, this critical state as an attractor. And it's kind of what happens in the sand pile. As you're um, dropping grains of sand, it's constantly getting attracted to the point to where it's going to landslide. And it happens over and over again. Um, and as you get to that point, what you find out is that systems can only sustain so much stress. And as it landslides, it actually reduces, the sand pile naturally reduces its amount of stress by landsliding, or yeah, by landsliding. It never resets it back to zero, but it, but it always reduces enough so that you continue to add more sand to the pile. And this is that macroscopic change from the microscopic change. You're not doing anything different as you drop each grain of sand, but at some point, the effect is going to be huge. It's, it's, the pile's not just going to get bigger. The pile's actually going to avalanche down. And this kind of says that like a trigger of any size can cause that large scale change. Um, and this, this is true in software, and this makes predicting really, really hard in software. As much as we like our velocity metrics, um, they only work to a certain point because there's still always the possibility that the next iteration, you've just gotten your system to the point where it's going to landslide, or it's got to landslide. Regardless of how smooth and how well you're past iteration velocity had gone. So when I was reading about this, I was like, oh my god, like this, this is really cool. This seemed really excited because this software, this like, oh my god, a dynamical system, that's just like a sand pile. This is a metaphor that connects with me. Um, this is, the usual metaphor is technical debt. You know, you, cl you get all this technical debt, but that only goes so far, and it never really connected with me because what happens when you, you know, collect all of this technical debt? Well, nothing. You, you just keep, you know, you just keep building onto the debt. Um, and so that, that doesn't really work. But this, the sand pile metaphor kind of it fits for me because as I'm adding um, functionality to my software, I know that it's becoming more complex. And I know that it's, that it's becoming more complex, and I know that at some point, if, if I don't curate that sand pile, if I don't rake it out, even it out, get rid of some of those jagged peaks, then what's going to likely happen is something that I don't want to have happen. It's going to be in a horrible state. It's not going to be maneuverable. I'm not going to be able to evolve it. So I equate adding functionality to the system as, as like dropping a grain of sand. 
And I equate adding a feature is like dropping multiple grains of sand. You're making a bunch of little changes. And then all these things, you know, we're, we're building up our sand pile again and again and again. And as we're doing this, um, software, attraction, critical point. And that critical point in software represents that the system's in a really bad state. So unlike sand piles, software doesn't naturally avalanche itself. Um, we have to actually go in there and kind of cause the landslide as the, the people who are working on the code. So when we get the system to this, this critical point, this dotted green line, um, our system is in such a bad state that we really can't maneuver or evolve our system anymore. So the only kind of option is, is we almost have to take like a you know, feature freeze, a development freeze, to actually go in there and fix a bunch of stuff. We've got to clean up a bunch of stuff. This might happen to the entire system. This might happen to, to one area of the system. But wherever it happens, if we're trying to add stuff to it, you know, we kind of get in there and we're, we're stuck. We can't really add anything. Um, we've got to clean up. So a really oversimplified example of, of this is if you think about like a monolithic program. So you've just got one file that you're going to work within to code up this program. Um, and you're not going to use, like, there's no classes. There's no modules. You basically, you've got global variables and functions. And namespaces are all the same. So you're going in there, and initially it's pretty easy to add some stuff because there's nothing there. So you can you know, pick whatever names you want, organize the code however you want. It doesn't really matter. Um, but then tomorrow you're going to make some more changes and you add to it. And you keep doing this, and very quickly that monolithic program becomes very difficult for you to move and maneuver around in. You've got, since you've got a global namespace, um, you've got all of these naming collisions. You've got to, so you've got to go in there and find some conventions like, oh, what conventions do I want to use to denote this type of functionality or this part of the system or to communicate this concept? Um, so even though it started out very simply because there's nothing there, it doesn't take very long before you've, you've got to figure some stuff out and go in and clean some stuff up so that you can continue adding to it. Now, it's oversimplified because we don't code like that. We're not relegated to... Um, a single file or a global namespace where we don't have access to classes and modules and other things like those. Um, but real software is more interesting. It has more of everything, um, which is good, but it's also bad because it means it's going to take longer for us to figure out that we've made bad, that we've made bad decisions. One thing that's really nice about working in a really simple programming paradigm, like the monolithic program, is that we're going to know very soon if some of our decisions are going to cause some pain. Whereas when we're dealing with the software that we make today, we've got so many options available to us that you know, we could be going for months before we realize that some of the decisions we made early on were actually really bad decisions. Um, but by the time we feel the pain, there's, you know, it's, it, I won't say it's too late, but there's, just, there's a lot more work because there's months of work that used, use those assumptions. And sand pile, you know, we're not dealing with one sand pile, we're dealing with sand piles and sandboxes. Um, we've got many parts of our systems, and kind of each part of the system, I like to think of it visually um, as its own sand pile. Um, and then I like to think of parts of the system that, that kind of touch maybe through, uh, there's an object that touches both, and there's a coordinating object that touches both parts of the systems. So if you've got these sand piles, you know, the, the parts that kind of touch. I like to visually think about things that way. Um, but then we've also got subsystems. So we've got our, the application we're working on, but then we've got all these dependencies, subsystems that we may be working on or other parts of our team are working on. Um, so teams often get caught by starting out at this rapid pace, only to be kind of halted um, not long thereafter. So has anyone, I guess, observed, experienced, or been on a project that you know, day one, awesome. Day 90, you know, it's not awesome. I've, I've been on those. And this is, this is what I think happens, is day one is awesome, but they're basically like, they're just building this ginormous pile, to, you know, from now to day 90. So that they want to get out of the gates as fast as possible, um, add features as fast as possible, um, which is a great goal. Um, but in doing that, they just kind of throw, you know, all caution to the wind, and they just build up this giant 
giant pile. And when this guy slant, you know, landslides, it's, it's going to impact the entire system. Um, another thing that I've seen is kind of these jagged peaks um, is as people are making changes, they actually you know, say, hey, I'm going to spend a couple minutes, I'm going to think about how I'm going to organize this code. But then it kind of goes, that's about it. So they've got all these pockets of all these jagged peaks. And then they run into the, this problem, where the simple act of adding something to the system, so this is moving the system closer to its critical, po to its critical point, um, they fall into this vicious stop-go cycle. So they're kind of like racing from the beginning adding stuff, and as they were adding stuff, uh, the difficulty of working within their system reached that critical point really quick. And then to, make, to move forward, to make progress, they've got to go in there, they've got to change some of that stuff, they've got to clean something up. So they usually just clean up just enough to keep moving again. Um, and that's kind of this jagged peak and valley, peak and valley, peak and valley. Is, uh, I've never, I've, I've very rarely seen a team that actually goes in and takes the time necessary to actually put the system in an overall good state that it can be evolved again. What they do is they go in and they make the minimal changes just to hack something else in there. But then they're right back where they started. Um, and then from here on out to the end of the project, you know, they might be on a death trajectory. They're going to kind of follow this. And this leads to a misconception of pragmatism. Uh, early on, they thought they were making the best decisions because they were going as fast as possible. Um, but that's not the case. What happens is they're actually working as fast as possible to get to the slowest possible pace of actual development. Uh, and experience has told me that initially it requires more work to avoid the critical point than to work towards it. So early on when you're starting on a project, Greenfield or it's a very young one or it's a small code base, um, it's often easier to just keep adding stuff to the system because it's easy then. Um, when really what we should probably be doing is putting stuff in place to kind of avoid those problems long term. So here we've got a purple slash pink line. And it's, it's a little bit more difficult to get some infrastructure in place. Um, you know, this could be as simple as, you know, we're going to, we're adding a, a CI box. We're going to make sure that our automated test suite actually runs. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about different conventions we're going to use to describe um, different parts of the system uh, based on whatever domain we're modeling or we're going to be building. But it takes a little bit more effort up front. But over the long run, it actually it works out because the difficulty is a lot lower, so we're probably moving a lot faster. Uh, and we avoid this peak and valley, kind of that vicious cycle. Now, un unfortunately, this isn't like a universal thing. This doesn't apply to all things because smaller apps get away with a lot of things that larger apps don't get away with. Um, if your app like reaches 1.0 or reaches its target goal, um, bef you know, early on, you, you may be able to avoid hitting the vicious cycle. It, it just may never be an, a problem. Um, and if you're working on a large app, though, you don't have that same luxury. And a lot of times, it's hard to know exactly when you're going to hit that point. Um, but I've, I've worked with some developers who a lot of, I guess, I would say people who are fresh out of college or have a couple of years of experience of working on some apps, or they come from like a mar marketing agency and they want to get into custom software dev, what happens is they come in and they're used to working on these really small apps. So you're working with them on these slightly larger apps, and they, they don't have any reference point. So they, they don't know anything about the vicious cycle. They don't know anything about kind of getting to the point where your system is going to, or requires a landslide. So they make all of these similar decisions of, you know, throwing in plugins here, just throwing stuff there. And because the reference point is only the small app, um, but those development practices are very different. So based on what you're building, a smaller app or a larger app, um, you might be able to get away with different things. You might actually fine tune your practices um, to kind of be optimized for the type of app that you're building. And I am trying to get into actually making a lot of smaller apps, even in larger apps, breaking that down into smaller components. Um, maybe you've got multiple apps that are all mounted uh, to different URL endpoints. But over time, none of the stuff is all of a sudden. Um, it's kind of the result of these successive additions. 
um, to the system, which kept adding unnecessary complexity on top of unnecessary complexity. And then those things branch out to the collaborators of certain objects or consumers, and then they cause more complexity to be added. And then those potentially add out to things that are using that, um, especially if that complexity is uh, kind of seen in the, the, the interface of your public methods or the things that you're going to be passing in. You know, based on how many chains you got to go to where those arguments are getting passed through, um, you could be adding a lot of uh, unnecessary complexity throughout the entire system. So how do we keep software away from its own critical point? I mean, it's not something that we can know ahead of time. We don't know based on the type of system that we're building that, you know, oh, hey, this is a clear indicator. We just plug in these variables in this function. And, Day 91, if we do the exact same thing we're doing today, day 91 will be our, you know, the day of reckoning. Um, we, we don't know that. Um, so what are some of the things that, that we can do? The first one, I think, is to fall in love with simplicity. Um, regardless of the practices or the processes that you're using or the methodologies that your team uses, um, you really want to fall hard for simplicity because Similar to pushing that ginormous elephant at the beginning, uh, all of the practices, processes, and tools that we use, those are all helping us fight against complexity because complexity is, that's just the intrinsic nature of software. So we want to fall in love with simplicity. Um, we want to loathe unnecessary complication. The things that we are building aren't simple. Um, and to come in and think naively that things that we're building should just be, you know, as simple as a wheel just isn't, isn't going to happen because we're not building a wheel. We're building cars that have lots of wheels and combustion engines and a bunch of crazy things. But complication, um, complication and complexity are kind of similar. But complexity, I, I like to separate them out because complexity isn't a bad thing. Unnecessary complexity is, but complexity isn't a bad thing. It just means you have multiple simple components working together to do something. Um, and I think, and that's a good thing. But complication is when I think when you get unnecessary complexity in there, where the complexity that, that you're adding is just, it's just, it's not essential, it's not needed, but it's just there anyways. And those are the types of unnecessary complication that we want to loathe and avoid, call out. Um, and then perfection, we, we need to not think about perfection. I think as like developers are on their journey, you know, when they go out and, and read the design pattern book. I know about about nine years ago when I read the Gang of Four book, you know, I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. Um, and I, for a certain period of time, you know, you, you fall into that trap of, like, you're trying to all of a sudden, like, fit those patterns perfectly into the systems that you're building. Um, and experience gets you over that hump, and experience helps you recognize that, you know, perfection, fitting things in perfectly, just that's not going to get you anywhere. That's going to cause paralysis. You're going to sit there and, and think too hard and far too long about parts of the system that just are negligible. Um, and then if you, if you fall in love with simplicity and you loathe unnecessary complication and you, and you throw perfection out the window, and it's not saying that like, you know, you're just going for good enough, but it's just saying that you're not going to go for perfection. Um, you know, you, then you're going to kind of probably champion complexity. You're going to take this rat's nest of yarn, and you're going to turn it into something over here. Now, I don't know about you, but I look at the thing on the right, and that is still complex. There, there's a lot of complexity in that, um, in that diagram, or I don't know what you call those, in that yarn craft. But there's also a lot of simplicity in it, and you can kind of see the simplicity through the patterns that emerge, um, through the kind of the color patterns, the structural patterns, how it was built, where none of those things are, are prevalent over on the left-hand side. So as you're going through things, you want to listen, feel, respond, learn to all of this feedback. And I'm going to dive real quick back into the earlier code example. Um, and we ended up changing that part of the system. So I would imagine that if we did it from the beginning, this might be how it would go. So we, we had this results thing, this array, and we just wanted to be able to get records from solar. So rather than jumping into subclass array, um, 
you know, it might be simpler just to have a, a, the, sol the solar request explicit. So we're going to make that concept explicit. So uh, instead of having uh, the, the array subclass also handle converting solar data to our models, you know, solar actually already returned stuff in JSON, and our system already worked with JSON. So we said, you know, what the heck? We're, we're just going to rely on simple JSON support for converting solar results. We don't need to add any more unnecessary um, complexity for doing those things. So that was the first step. And then the next step they wanted to do was add the, the query, more query options. So we decided that, you know, this release, the query options really has nothing to do with making the solar request. So we'll go ahead and just make the query explicit. Um, that lets us kind of encapsulate all of the, the, the knowledge for how to convert uh, options in our system to options in the, the URL that Solar receives. And then we can make a simple update to our, um, to our Solar request and just tell it, hey, use the Solar query. And then we had those working components, and we said, you know what the heck, We're, we want this to be in a really nice consumable class because we want it to be simple to use, simple to reuse. We want its API to be understandable. So we went ahead and just we made a kind of a coordinating object, and all it did was it, it took that solar request, the solar query, um, and the thing that uh, used the JSON to convert things to models in our systems. And we wrapped that uh, in a class, and now we've got these, these three separate objects all kind of, there's a clear line of distinction between them. Uh, they're simple to understand. Uh, the, the, the code in each of them is very minimal, so they're simple uh, on an individualistic basis uh, to go in and change or to make updates to. And they're also very easy to test. It also made it very easy to reuse. Um, this is an example using the, the Ruby module pattern. Um, but more importantly, in a more generic sense, we want to. We could, if we wanted to use it in some other class, we can create some other class. If we wanted to, you know, just instantiate our find and load from Solar um, object and have it find things. If we wanted to, kind of munch some of the options to override some of the defaults, you know, maybe we do that. And then this guy becomes easy to test. But all of these things, kind of, for me, go get down to values over practices. This isn't to say that practices aren't important, but it is to say that values are more important. So if, if you're a TDD junkie, um, I mean no offense. But uh, TDD is a practice that you use to realize a certain value that you have about your software. You want um, software that you can ship often. You want software that you know is of high quality. You want software that you know is uh, maintainable, maneuverable, want, um, and whether you do TDD or, or test after, all of those, those are just practices that help you kind of realize um, those other values in your software. And if you actively seek ways to exploit your values, the practices will come naturally. If you're actively exploring new ways to find um, simplicity in how you organize your code or how you um, break up concepts in your problem space to concepts in your solution space, um, th then you're going to find practices that are going to align with those. Um, when people put practices first, um, they tend to imitate, especially if the values aren't the things that are driving them. They imitate, and that leads to misapplication and misunderstanding, and that wreaks havoc because they're not driving their software with what's important. And the important part are the values. Um, I've seen, uh, or I've met a bunch of people who don't like testing at all because they've gone in and they've read the books and they've tried to apply it, but it never works. It's always painful. Um, it always takes way too long. They never get into a groove. Um, and it's easy to say, well, you're doing it wrong. But I've met far too many people who are actually trying um, to apply these things but they're missing that key component. They're, they're not driving it with the values, so they don't recognize that the situation that they're in right now, the approach they just read about in that book probably isn't a very good fit for that um, because they're not identifying what they're trying to get out of it. They're just saying, some guy told me to go test, so I'm trying to write a test. 
end practices can all be, they can be good and they can be bad. Um, refactoring, my favorite example, I'm a Ruby programmer, I'm a Rails guy, so this is gonna come from the Rails world. My favorite example of bad refactoring decisions in Rails is they have this concept of a controller, and that's the thing that, pro like, when a web request comes in, it kind of, uh, your controller takes that request and does something and then returns the result. Well, people will get these controllers and they'll have a method like it's say an index action if you're going to like list, you know, slash products, you want to see a list of all the products. So they'll have this index method and they'll let it get ginormous. They'll have all of this logic in there and, uh, and then it's pretty gross. And then they'll see some guy says, well, you know, you should have skinny controllers. You shouldn't have these giant methods in your controllers, that's really bad. So what they'll do is they'll actually take all of that code and they'll go, they'll go create a model and they'll just like cut it out of the controller and they'll go put it in the model. And that, that was like the, that was their idea of refactoring. And that's, that's not really refactoring at all, that's just kind of, you know, you moved one mess from one spot to another spot. Um, but for all intents and purposes, they think they're refactoring. The same thing goes with, with writing tests. Um, as I just talked about a second ago. You can do a great job of writing tests, but it's really easy for people to do a bad job. And this is great why everyone here is at conferences like this, because you get to um, collaborate with others, talk to others, hear people talk about things, um, to try to get a sense of how do you write good tests, how do you approach software in a, in a, in a better way than I'm doing it today. Um, but it's, it's far too easy to go ahead and write bad tests as well. An example of writing a bad test is, and this is uh, a, a plus for the TDD crowd and a minus for the test after crowd, is you, you go in and you write this, uh, this, this class and it's got all this functionality and it works great. Um, you love it, but now you want to go in there and you want to add some tests around it. So you try to add some tests, um, kind of like that solar sub, that, that subclass array that we saw. Like maybe that thing was working awesome, but they want to go add some tests around it, but there are so many dependencies on getting those test things work, to work. I mean, they don't have any, they don't have any there's no concept of dependency injection. Um, so in that case, like, they actually have to dive into the internals of the system, mock out the net HTTP calls, um, handle all of the HTTP status codes. Uh, you know, they, they have to go into that same test and have that return valid solar results so those can be converted to models in our system. Um, the test has to know about all of the different models in our system that they want to query against. And so they try to add this test around this class that did something and did, did it well, but it was just designed really poorly, so adding the test is horrible, but they leave the test there, and the test is really brittle, and it's frail, and it's fragile, and any small change anywhere in the system seems to break it. And those, those two examples, um, I, I think, apply to a number of other things. So insert practice here, and you can do a really good job of doing this, or you can do a really bad job. And to me, to get on the good side is to focus on the the values. Um, the values are going to steer you in that direction. Whereas if it's just imitation, um, then you're not, going to, you're not going to have anything that's going to let you know, you know, good or bad. So I, practices are important, but values are the things that are at their core. Um, they impact, or whether they're plentiful or lacking, they impact every practice that you do. Um, the practices can change frequently, the values will rarely change. And lack of emphasis on core values, I think, more, leads more quickly to kind of this large, stubborn elephant of a system that we're trying to, you know, get on that train and it's not going anywhere. And to get back to the sand pile metaphor, or a giant sand pile that's just waiting to avalanche and wreak havoc on our system. And values help determine where we drop our grains of sand in our sandbox. Each of our systems is a sandbox. Um, we kind of get to choose where we're going to put stuff, how we're going to distribute it. Um, if we do a good job over time, maybe we avoid a lot of landslides. Or maybe we have really small landslides, and, you know, and that's not that big of a problem. Maybe we just want to avoid these, these, giant, these giant sand piles where the, the landslide is just going to wreak, wreak large amounts of havoc. Um, and this idea that, like, you know, values first, and you know every change that we make to the system could potentially grow our sand pile up to where it could you know cause a landslide. You know, it, it may be tough to swallow. Um, I've gotten feedback on this idea, and not everyone likes it, and that's okay. Um, but I like it. Um, it rings true for me. 
because I think what we're really fighting against is is complexity. It's it's not we're not fighting for practices. We're not fighting for processes. Uh, we're fighting against complexity, and these other things help us help us kind of hopefully win that fight. And I think it takes a lot of uh, humility um, as a person to admit our faults as people, to admit that sometimes our intuition gets it wrong, to admit that, that the things that we do today, the, the micro decisions we do today may cause large scale macroscopic effects later. Um, and they might not be the ones that we want. So I'll leave you guys with this question. Just how's the landscape of your software, both now and moving forward, and I hope after coming to this, um, give you some things to, to think about, and I hope the landscape of your software improves. So thanks. And does anyone have any questions or feedback? Yeah? I, I, really, uh, I really appreciate your <laughs> use of metaphors. Um, I'm not a coder, and, and I'm a project manager I'm trying to figure out ways I can work better and avoid some of these pitfalls. Uh, the sand pile uh, analysis is fantastic. Uh, I've been unable to articulate why our velocity is, you know, went up quickly and then leveled and then it sort of actually crumbled, right? And that was the, the avalanche effect. Yep. Um, so I just want to say thanks. Uh, you know, you lost me with the rows and rows and rows of code and I expected that to happen, but it happened a lot less in, in your speech, so I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. On the, uh, looking at that example in the Ruby that you gave, um, it seemed like you got your code up to a point of critical, you got it up to the critical point, and then what did you do? Did you just throw it all away and re rewrite it, start over again, or did you gently refactor it into the state where it's in that? I'll, I'll tell you what we did, and some people may cringe at this, but um, I, I think it was the right decision. So when working with legacy code that's to a certain point. Um, I don't believe that small refactoring is the way to go all of the time. Because I, sometimes, uh, we, what we actually did, we went in there and, and we actually created a new class. And as we identified all of the responsibility, all of the things, it was very tedious to go map out like, what is, what is this giant array subclass actually doing? Mapping out all this functionality. We moved things kind of one by one to this, to this new class, so we kind of grouped like the HTTP request thing. We want to pull all, the first goal is we want to pull all the HTTP stuff out. So we just created a new, new class and then we started, we, we pulled some stuff from it, but we kind of used it more of a, as a reference point. And we actually rebuilt um, those other classes um, side by side while they, we were using the existing thing. And then, and we did it and, and, we, and we had those things testable and we tested it. And then we just deleted the old code and inserted the, the new one. Um, but on, on stuff like that, I've been bit where like really minute refactorings, when you have part of the system that's just really gross and it has gotten to a point of complexity, like it's just it's kind of a losing battle to make the smallest possible refactoring change in those situations. I would much rather actually study that part of the system, study it with my pair, write down all of the things it's actually doing, and then rather than be discouraged by having to work with this behemoth of crappy code. Um, be inspired to instead be like, okay, that was working, but w how can we actually solve this? And how can we break down all of these responsibilities into something that you know we can be you know we can be proud of, but also does the job? And in those cases, I think that actually is faster. Um, but when it's not that you know when it's not when you just have a method and you've got one method and it's a little dirty and you want to clean it up, um, then I think the smaller refactoring steps are key, but when you've got part of the system that's just really gross and messy, I, I like to take the other approach. Anything else? We've got 20 minutes, I think. Um, so if there, is there anything else that you want to, any of you guys want to talk about? It doesn't have to be related to this talk. It could just be Anything that's on your mind. It could be, should I be using JRuby and RSpec? <coughs> yes. Uh, yes, well, can you speak to that? Uh, 
Jay Ruby versus uh, uh, Ruby and, and Jay Ruby on Rails versus Ruby on Rails, and what is your thoughts on that? I. I've only used JRuby when I've needed to integrate with um, existing Java libraries or tools. So I, I, I'm a, if I not do anything with the Java, the ecosystem, then I just stick to um, the normal C Ruby implementation. Um, and most of that is because I mostly de deploy to Heroku. Um, and I, don't th I don't think Heroku has like a JRuby you can just deploy it out there. Um, but, but when I've used JRuby, it has worked well. And now that they are, I believe they have 1.9 support. Um, JRuby has, uh, supports Ruby 1.9 syntax and stuff, I believe. I think that will probably make it a lot nicer. But it's been awesome when we've needed to integrate with existing Java ecosystems. Yeah. Some of your earlier slides, you had, you know, if you're probably if you're doing this today, you're probably going to do that tomorrow and all that stuff, right? Yep. But, um, my experience is kind of different. So even if people are doing something today, it's very easy for them to not to do it tomorrow. And and it's even if you kind of developed it as a habit, like TDD or you know even doing Pomodoro or you know all these little techniques that are really good for us. It's like going to church, right? You, you want to go to church every Sunday, but sometimes you just don't want to go to church, right? And, and that's my experience, is that there, there's, there's really a big pull on a lot of people to not be good. Maybe it's being lazy, or maybe they blame it on church or something. I don't know. So, I don't know. Do you see this sometimes, or is it consistently, if you're going to do it today, you're going to consistently um, so for, so everyone else can hear. Um, so he's saying that when on the slides in the early in the presentation that say like if you know, if you tack on stuff today you'll tack on stuff tomorrow if you refactor today you'll refactor tomorrow that that he's um, actually seen kind of the opposite of that that it's it's often really easy to just not do those things even if you habitually refactor today there's a good chance that tomorrow you just won't do it um, and uh, it, and I will say I have seen that. Um, it is definitely, the more habitual something is, um, the easier it is for our, our brain to just want to do it. Um, and that doesn't you know, preclude us from not doing it. Um, but it just makes it easier. So if, if, if we never go through and we never write a test, then it's going to be much more difficult to make the decision to write a test if, we're, if we just never do it. Um, and it's going to be a lot more painful too. But if we're doing testing all the time, it's going to be a lot easier as we approach different problems in the code to go ahead and write a test for it or drive it with TDD. Um, same thing with refactoring. You know, if, if, we're just, if we're just used to cleaning stuff up. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not going to be outside pressures that come down and that you know, like someone's breathing down your neck as you're making this change. And so you, you just make the change and like push it, and you're like, there, it's done, and, and you don't actually go clean it up. Um, those things can happen. Um, but that, I think that, that goes back to like us as critical thinkers having to actually think about what we're doing and you know, make the decision to, to either say, yeah, I'm going to keep with what I want to do. I want to write a test for this, or I want to refactor this, versus, you know, there's some outside pressure, and I don't feel like I can. Um, what kind of things have you done in the past that helped you keep on track, like not fall off the wagon? Like people who diet, they, they sometimes, you've got the yo-yo dieters, right? They, fall, they have yeah. these tricks that they do to kind of, make themselves go stay on there. What kind of things have you done in the past to stay on track? So the question is, what kind of things have I done uh, in the past to help myself stay on, stay on track in doing some of these practices that I value and think are healthy? Um, well, the, the, a lot of this I can give up to just our team at Mutually Human. Um, so we are all very like-minded in how we approach software, how we approach people. There's a, a very uh, high level of mutual trust and respect. Um, I'm one of the partners at our company, but uh, everyone there feels comfortable to call me out when I make a poor decision. Um, and I think that goes a long way. We, and we, we do pairing, but we do kind of, I call it practical pairing. We don't pair 100% of the time. 
um, and we've got the, you know the kind of the belief that normal traditional pair program is very good transfer knowledge um, collaboration think things through uh, but there's also a time where individuals just need to kind of solve problems on their own and challenge their own brain um, and the, when you're doing the traditional pairing the feedback from your pair helps you stay on track especially if the expectation is you know what we're going to try to write the simplest code that we can and we want it to be testable because we want to uh, we want it to, to have a high quality and to protect against future regressions um, or to help us be aware of future regressions if they do happen before we ship it. Um, and so we've got that level playing field or the same set of expectations and you know, we'll call each other out. And if someone's working on something individually, there's usually peer review going on at some point. Um, and then, you know, if, and it's, it's never a personal tacky. That's a big thing. Like the, the, the respect and the trust between the team has got to be there. Because if that doesn't exist and someone's just given digs, then that's going to kill morale and people are not going to care. and um, They're not going to want to do those things, especially if the guy who's the testing guru always comes down really hard on the guy who's new to testing. You know, When really the goal should be like, the testing guru should be encouraging and supporting that guy and his, be that guy's biggest cheerleader um, because he's starting to embrace some of the things that the team thinks is healthy. So it sounds like, <clears throat> you know, like the weight loss analogy, um, if you are interested in maintaining the goal of staying healthy or whatever, you need to look at the situation more regularly through pair programming, through metrics, just like stepping on a scale, just like looking in the mirror. Yes. You know, if I'm not looking at it, the chances of it getting out of hand um, increase, right? Yeah. Yeah, if, 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 you're, not, if you're not looking at things, um, you might be. I, I, I'm guilty of this. I, I have collected some some coding habits over the years, which I thought were pretty decent coding habits. Um, and then at one point, a few years ago, I ran my code through a, a code analyzer, and I found that some of the things that I just defaulted to, because you know I like the aesthetics of how this layout worked, were actually not the best. Then I kind of had to like, oh my god, like you know, have an aha moment. Um, and then get a new default, figure out, like, that's not going to work. I can't do that anymore. Um, but had I never looked at those things, I would have never have realized it. Um, Can you share a specific example of that? Uh, like, a specific, are you saying a static analysis tool? Uh, identify something? Um, uh, I'll say an analysis tool just because it's super hard in Ruby to do static analysis. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we can't quite get the great benefit of um, of metrics or different types of complexity things that you can in Java or C sharp or other languages. Um, but one of the things uh, when I was, you know, metaprogramming, like a, you know, when you first learn Ruby and you just start to feel good from all the flexibility in the language and things you can't do in other languages, it's just like you know, it's. It's just the amount of power that you need to wield carefully. And, uh, and early on, I had gotten very excited about doing metaprogramming and using it far too often. Um, well, when you, when you use some of the metaprogramming techniques, you have a lot of code that is basically evaled, you know, these giant strings that get evaled. And when, you, when used appropriately, it can be a very effective tool for simplifying things. But when, when not used, to simplify something that otherwise would be more complex or require a lot more code, um, then you actually in, you increase a lot of the complexity because you're doing all these giant string evals and things, uh, and you're also you're making it extremely difficult um, to to be able to analyze and and find out where true like cyclomatic complexity measures are or you know, assignments, branches, and conditional counts. <laughs> Are because you can't analyze that code because it's not real Ruby code. It's it's not real code. So that was one of the things that like when I ran those things that was and that was a combination of actually trying to look at metrics for those things because I couldn't collect them and also um, I think probably being bitten by the fact that uh, since all this code is getting getting evaled like I'm actually making it more complicated because I can't find anything. None of my methods exist. You know, they don't exist until runtime. So, like, I want to go, re, you know, re change the name of this thing, and I got to go track down exactly, you know, what string or symbol is getting passed through somewhere 
to some point that it's eventually getting emailed as a method name. Um, so those two things combined would be one example. But I still think it's an amazing feature. I think all languages should have it. It's just yeah. Exactly. When you were talking about avoiding the critical point, one of the examples you gave was one great way to avoid it is not to build large projects. Build small projects and integrate. And I think intuitively that makes a lot of sense. And you and I speak about that as being a great option, but rarely do people seem to do it and so not catch on. And why do you think that is? Because it's harder initially. I think it's um, to think up front about Especially when the system is small, it, it seems like you're, I think, all right, well, I guess let me repeat. So J Justin's asking about um, one way to potentially avoid having these giant sand piles is to build smaller sand piles, you know, to build, basically have smaller, build smaller apps um, and then inter and integrate them together rather than having, like, just building one giant behemoth of an app. Um, and so how can we, um, or what are some of the things that we can do to, to do that or, and why aren't people doing that more? And I think people aren't doing that more uh, in the, the circles that I walk because uh, the time that you make those decisions are early on. But when it's early on, you essentially have a flat sand pot, you know, your sandbox is very flat there's, because there's not a whole lot of stuff in it. Um, so it seems like it's more work to, to draw that line of you know, distinction between different parts of the system that you're going to say, hey, this part's going to be responsible for this. I'm going to build this as a separate project. And this part is going to be responsible for this, and then we're going to integrate them this way. That actually requires more effort up front, I think, um, than just implementing it. It's um, not the simplest thing that could possibly work. Right, yeah, it's, it's not the simplest thing that could possibly work. Um, but then by the time where you get bit by having made that decision, you've made too many decisions and you can't go back. It's, you know, no one's going to pay you a month to go back and decouple everything. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, in a way, it's like a catch-22. Like, you want to do the simplest thing to move forward. But the simplest, I guess, the simplest isn't necessarily the easiest either. It's easier to do the decision where you just keep it in the code. But um, thinking about what you're doing holistically, it actually, it might be simpler to um, make these different parts of the program explicitly separate. Um, because you're reducing the number of concepts that when someone goes to work on this part of the system that they have to put in their head. Um, and you're reducing the amount of coupling that potentially could happen because you're not having that integrated with this other part of the system. Instead, there are these separate sandboxes, and you've got this very small integration point. So when you're talking about uh, breaking, uh, breaking the system into smaller pieces, that means that you have to have Problem. Uh, then, uh, uh, like uh, in the case where you have one rather big web application, are you then? I mean, you can't really break. It. Well, I guess you could, but I mean, it's really hard after the fact to break this up because they all go to the same connection pool. You know, they all use a lot of the infrastructure components that are, you know, they, they share, right? So it. it, it, it uh, from the start, it's easier, as you mentioned. But uh, are you also then, maybe instead of physically separating it out in that frame, maybe you could do it at the build level, where you could have, uh, like if you're using Maven, right, you can build components, you can componentize your software better so that you could have many different jar files that then are your source is then compiled into many different jar files instead of one giant, gigantic jar file instead of, like you could have multiple core components, you could separate it out at the software layer instead of at the physical layer. And you can slice and dice how you structure that, whether or not they're, they're truly separate applications or they're just separate components um, where you're delivering different jars um, for each part of the system that you, whatever. Yeah, whatever you want to separate out. Um, I, you can find a number of ways of doing that. And I won't say that, well, I guess we'll say, small apps are probably going to take you farther than a big, large app. Um, whether or not it's like truly like different applications 
or if you just have, you know, you might have one of your apps might just be the shell of the UI, and then, you know, that might just be one component, and then the other components might actually be the things that do all of the work. Um, so you really, when the user sees it, they're working with one app. They don't, they don't know. But behind the scenes, you've got things decoupled to the point to where the UI concerns and all of the UI logic is totally separate from all of the other stuff. And um, and you can even do this without having um, building separate components. Um, for your app. I mean, you could be very strict in how you, your coding conventions, how you organize code or how do things do things, and that could work. I, that's just going to be harder because it's easier, I think, to make things coupled. Um, whereas when you have a clear distinction, you know, that, that clear line of separation between those responsibilities, it's going to be much harder if you've got separate subsystems to break that than if everything plays in the same playground. Because at that point, it basically just comes down to how diligent and disciplined is the developer. Zero, I'm out. Thanks everyone, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>